Welcome to Healthcare IT Today. I'm John Lynn, together with my colleague and friend, Colin Hahn. The world of technology and healthcare ever-changing in new and novel ways, and that's why we love this stuff. So join us as we discuss the latest healthcare and health IT news, meshed together in new ways which help generate ideas and new perspectives. Plus, we'll have a little fun along the way. Today, we're going to be sharing our New Year's wish list for healthcare. And be sure to follow the show on social media at the hashtag HITSM and our personal accounts at TechGuy and at Colin underscore Hung. Plus, check out our 18 years of health IT blog content at healthcareittoday.com. You ready for some wishing? Is it, I, it's a genie. We get three wishes, but this time we're going to get four. <laughs> More wishes is a good thing, I think. But uh, yeah, no, it's exciting to start off the new year or at least talking about the new year and um, you know, what we're looking forward to or, or what we wish for in this coming year. <laughs> I have a lot of wishes, uh, <laughs> especially for healthcare. <laughs> It's a yes. pretty frustrating space sometimes, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't think four will cover everything we want to do in healthcare, but it's a start. It's a start. Yeah. Now, if we can only find that genie in the land, uh, the <laughs> genie in the healthcare land. <laughs> Is there a healthcare genie? Hmm. That sounds yes. like a good company name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there, is. there probably is, right? <laughs> but uh, yeah, it should be fun, John. So let, let's, let's hop right in. What are two changes in healthcare that, you would add to the top of your wish list. Okay. How about I start with one and then you can do one. And I'll just. Have All right. One. Sounds good. So my first one, this is my number one wish for healthcare is I would love for employers to get out of healthcare, healthcare <laughs> insurance. Like that would be my dream. It, you know, like the perverse incentives of healthcare are exacerbated in a really ugly way because employers are providing insurance to their their employees and if we just got rid of them right one employers don't want to pay for it two it creates some weird you know perverse incentives between employers and and providers and 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 their employees or their patients right it's just it just screws so much up so if we could get employers out let us just pay for our own, right? Maybe employers can pay us more rather than paying for health insurance. So we can pay for our own health insurance. I think a lot of things would be better. And then we would become more true consumers, which is why I love this idea the most is that right now we're not consumers because we think, oh, well, our employer's kind of paying for it. And for the longest time they did because healthcare was relatively inexpensive. And so we'd pay a copay and they'd cover the rest, right? But the way that this has evolved has not been good, and uh, I'd be happy for employers to get out. And I think every employer would be happy to get out of health insurance, too. Yes, I think what you're wishing for is one of those wishes where everyone's like, yes, please make this happen. And like, but it's such a complicated, nuanced problem. That it literally takes a genie so in a bottle. <laughs> you, you need the genie. You definitely need the genie. Uh, but no, I, I think you're right. I mean, getting the employers, I think, again, what what that was is a structure that was based in the 1950s and 60s when that made a lot of sense, right? It, 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 and But nowadays, with a lot of people being entrepreneurs and self-employed and let's let alone forget about content creators and so forth, like the employer-based healthcare model just breaks down in, in modern times. Well, uh, and also, if you said, there's perverse... Then. Right. Do you know how it started is because they couldn't pay their employees more. So they needed a way to pay them more. So they said, we'll give you insurance. That's exactly. how it started. It wasn't intentful. It was just like, here's a way to get away around the wage issues that we have. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. When you look at the history of, of how it came about, it's just, it's just by happenstance, right? How the wages were frozen. And this was the only way to attract more people to, to come and work at your company was to offer uh, benefits. And one of the benefits being healthcare. And we just sort of stuck with it, right? <laughs> so, so yeah, I think it's, it, unfortunately, it's one of those ingrained things that it's going to take a while to unwind. But I think everyone would be cheering for that. No, no matter what part of the healthcare ecosystem you come from, the only people who lose in this are the brokers. Right. Like that's it. <laughs> right. That's that's who loses. But let's be honest, everyone else, I think even the payers would go, yes, let's leave, remove this layer. Let's go direct. Right. Like it's just so fascinating uh -huh. because then why is there so much resistance to it politically? Like there's a lot of things in healthcare that get resistance politically because it's politically poison, right? <laughs> because it's the number one employer in 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 you know in various you know constituencies, et cetera. 
but this one is the one that I think most of us would agree. Although ironically, some people could twist it to make the the employee feel like they're getting less. And to be fair, some employers may screw their employees and not pass on the what they paid for health insurance to the employee. So that that's that's the challenge, I guess, is that you know it probably <laughs> wouldn't play out quite as you know as nice as we would like. <laughs> Uh, you know, John, I, I like it. You almost, you know, you had me going there for a minute. I thought you were maybe advocating for socialist health care, but, and, you know, that would warm my Canadian heart, but, but you stopped short, but that's okay. It's a step. It's a step yeah, getting rid of the it's employers. It's definitely short. I, I still want to see it to ourselves, <laughs> but. Uh... <laughs> well, my, my wish list is totally, it's an IT focused one. Uh, I would love if 2024 was we solve the interoperability problem in healthcare. That you know, everywhere you would, everywhere you go, information would flow freely, cost-free, friction-free, simply in the right format to the right people. That's my wish because that is at to me at the root of so many issues in healthcare and so many inefficiencies. You know, just not being everything from not being able to take the data that I've uh, you know had an emergency room visit back to my family doctor all the way through to multiple specialists that I have to see who don't belong maybe to the same network or have problems sharing it. I think there's just so much friction generated by this. I would love for that genie to solve this problem for us. And then we can just move on to other innovations because to me, this unlocks a whole bunch of things that we could now do if we just solve this, right? Mm -hmm. um, and like you, I think there's enough people who go, we're tired of this. We don't make any money solving this problem. Let's just get this done. And then we can move on to real innovation I would love to see this fixed in 2024. Well, Colin, you got your wish. They just announced the Q hints, isn't that? <laughs> right, right. Ah, it, I thought it's it, a that grounded your wish. You got Q hints. <laughs> They're going to solve all the interoperability problems. Nothing would make me happier, John. <laughs> if that were, were true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a multifaceted problem, right? That Q hints aren't going to solve. I mean, you know, uh, it still goes back to facts is the most interoperable part of healthcare, um, uh, which is a sad statement, but true. Uh, yeah, no, it wouldn't be nice, right? Uh, you know, and, and what's fascinating is how many patients think that's true. Mm -hmm. so most patients think that when they go to their doctor, that all their doctors and, you know, the pharmacy and labs and, and long-term care, et cetera, retail health, they're all talking to each other and sharing their data. So that it is there. Uh, and then, you know, anyone that has a chronic condition gets like smashed in the face by the fact that it's not true. In fact, it's worse than that, probably, you know, it's sharing bad data that's not even accurate or, or things like that. So, yeah, that's a good one. I mean, another genie problem, but uh, <laughs> like, <laughs> the, the, yeah, it would be it would be nice. Right. And what's interesting is you could solve for this in small ways. Right like within yes. a health system and, and different stuff. So like that's doable. So I'd love to see it for that to happen. Interesting. <laughs> What's your second one, John? What other, what other thing would you add to your wish list? It's interesting that mine aren't tech. They're more business model related, which I don't know what that says. There's probably a message here that it's a business problem <laughs> in healthcare, not a tech problem that we've said many times. But here's the one that I would love. And you're going to appreciate this one, Colin, since you live in Canada. Although you might suffer by this one, but anyway, I'm willing to have you suffer a little for this one. Uh, and that is, I would love for the U.S. government to say, you only have to pay what every other country is paying for pharma, right? Like, it, it's just <laughs> so wrong that the U.S. is paying $2,000 for the same medication in Germany that they're paying twenty five fifty. You know, <laughs> like, there is just something fundamentally wrong about that. And, and if they, you know, I, I don't care which country you want to choose, whoever has some standard pricing, choose your favorite, right? Or do an average of all of them, right? That's fine, right? They're the highest price at, at these 10 countries. I don't, I don't care how you approach it, but just choose one other and just say, hey, whatever you're charging there, you have to charge us the same price. Like, it seems logical that like someone would want to do this. And my only argument for why it probably hasn't happened is that the pharma lobby is doing their job really well. Like it, does, it doesn't make sense why we're subsidizing the rest of the world. And like I said, you would suffer because Canada's prices would go up because they would raise the prices in other countries and, and there would be an interesting battle. And I don't know all the uh, 
the unintended consequences of this, but just it fundamentally feels wrong that we're paying so much more for the exact same drug from the exact same manufacturer as other countries. Yeah, drug pricing is uh, is interesting, right? Like <laughs> when you look at other countries and and yeah, you're right. It is not fair for one population anywhere to subsidize another. Um, but at the same time, you know, I think if you look at it just uh, holistically, I think it's also a little bit obscene that um, the profit margin trumps everything else. Like, so forgetting about how or if it should, government should set prices or not, because you could argue that, right? But but just yeah. you look at that and go, you're making so much money off of these drugs. I get that you have to pay for r and I get that you should make a profit. I'm not against the profit. But when you look at the obscene amounts of profit that these companies are spinning off, you kind of have to question, like, why are the U.S. prices not at least coming down? Like, forgetting about whether you need to match, but at least go, guys, like, you know, your 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 profits are in the billions. You could afford a little bit to, to like, lower the price or, or get it more to reasonable or at least some of the life-saving drugs like, like diabetes drugs, like other drugs like that, where you go, okay, let's reduce the price on that. We'll keep these ones high because those ones are still very rare and, very you know, they're still experimental. Anyway, it is, yeah. I mean, definitely drug pricing in general is a problem. And even in countries like Canada, it's a problem too. It's not as if all of the prices are set sure. universally, right? No, and I, I imagine that it has its own challenges when you're, you know, because I'm not sure setting prices is the right solution exactly. And don't get me started talking about PBMs, which are just this innocuous, no one understands exactly what's going on here. And it's just hiding profits, I think, it, you know, and certainly there may be some countries where it does make sense to sell it for cheaper because they can't afford it otherwise. You know, certainly there's that. But to your point, how much profit is enough profit, right? Like, right. you know, and, and and yeah, sure, you can talk R&D until you're, you know, blue in the face. But, you know, at some point, it's not about R&D. It's about the profits that you're taking from it. And, you know, that that's not true. So it, it's a tough balance. It's not something I expect will change because of the politics behind it. But, you know, this that fundamentally just feels wrong. Although it's interesting. We are seeing this a little bit. Like, look at, uh, at insulin. I don't know what's going to happen with insulin and how they're going to lower the prices and how they're going to do it, but that's the first one they're going to be playing with and how that plays out will maybe a, a look into the future. But yeah, I mean, let, let's, let's figure out the prices. It's fine to make am, a profit, but not that obscene. <laughs> I am confident that business will find a way to generate profit, no matter what system we put in. So let's put a system in that at least lowers the prices for Americans and that way, and then we'll figure out, a bit, I'm sure they'll find a different way to make profit back, right? Like, I, they'll find a way. Uh, but yeah, I agree with that one. My my second one is another tech one, which is ironic, because usually I'm the one talking about the business side more than you, John. But but my second one is, I wish the genie would come out of the bottle and basically erect some giant moat around healthcare that it would be no longer the victim of any cyber or ransomware attacks. Ooh. Because this to me, this to me is one of the most... Uh, fundamentally wrong kind of attack. Like you're basically attacking organizations that are helping others, right? Like, and you're gonna hold these people for ransom. Now I get maybe the US healthcare is maybe seen as a profit center, but these are not pharma companies, right? Like, or insurance companies. These are like people providing care to other people and the attacks that are on them and the fact that they don't have a lot of money to spend on infrastructure, like some of the bigger banks and military and so forth, they're just, I wish that somehow we could erect a giant moat around all of healthcare and go, okay, we're all protected. We can go about and stop wasting all this money and spending on cybersecurity. We're all secure. And then we can move on from that. And, and this is probably the most sensitive information behind financial data that anyone would not want to get out onto the black market, right? Like your personal health information. Um, so that would be on my wish list. Definitely not a problem that is going to be solved in 2024. But, but something I wish we could. Yeah, it's kind of like the recent breach that I don't know if you saw, I think it was 23andMe with the DNA. And what was, you know, so impactful about that breach is you can't cancel your DNA and get a new number. Right. <laughs> like, sure, you can cancel your credit card and you can, but with DNA, your DNA is your DNA and you can't change that. 
they can't modify it. You can't, well, I mean, we're working to modify it. We'll see how that plays out. But, <laughs> you know, like your DNA is essentially your imprint for life. And so once that's breached, there's no going back. There's no like ability to hide that sensitive, very sensitive personal data. So, yeah, I mean, that, that, that would be incredible. And I think, you know, I think CIOs would finally enjoy their job if they didn't right. have to stay up sleeping and <laughs> awake exactly. at night wondering if, uh, if they're going to be attacked and what's going to happen. Did they secure everything properly? So that would be powerful even from a burnout perspective. Yeah, no, I, I yeah, again, wish list item, but uh, well, well, fingers crossed one day that might happen. Hey, if you're just tuning in, you're listening to Healthcare IT Today with John Lin and Colin Hung. Today, we're talking about our New Year's wish list. And one of the wishes that we both have on our list is for more people to recognize and be recognized for the great work that they're doing in healthcare marketing. Because far too often, those people are doing a lot of work, but it's all behind the scenes with little or no recognition. So with that in mind, we want to remind you that our Sway Health Awards are now accepting nominations. It's the perfect way to recognize the amazing healthcare marketing teams in your life. Uh, and there's absolutely no cost to submit a nomination, nor is there any cost to win an award. They are completely cost free. All right. So <laughs> please, please, please go to sway.health. That's sway with two A's dot health. Go to the awards tab at the top. Click on that and please enter a nomination. Just fill out the simple form on there. We just have to tell us why they deserve an award, and then it'll be go in. It'll go into the adjudication committee, who will then make a decision on who wins the awards in all the various categories. So there are categories and awards for people in health IT companies, in healthcare providers, healthcare marketing agencies, nonprofit organizations, and individuals. So basically, anybody and everybody in the healthcare world can apply and be nominated. I would nominate you, Colin, but I think you're not qualified. You're disqualified. Yes. There, there is a rule that says Sway Health people cannot win our own awards. Yeah, that's too bad. I'd <laughs> sad, <give you> sad, <laughs> sad face, but I, understandable. No, but thank you. Um, all right, let's get to the next question, John. Um, what regulatory change is on top of your wish list? Yeah, so you know what I would love from a regulatory perspective, and this is a, a nice IT one for you. I'm finally, you know, living up to my tech guy uh, <laughs> Twitter account. But, uh, you know, the regulatory change that I would love is for them to stop regulating the use of the EHR and the functionality of the EHR and instead focus on what can it accomplish. So, for example, instead of saying, do you have XYZ functionality, just say, you have to share data, you know, back to the interoperability problem you propose, you know, you have to share data. And guess what? The only way to do that is with an EHR, right? Like you don't need to regulate whether that has that function, because if you incentivize and reward the sharing of health data, I mean, sure, maybe some people are going to do some random stuff, but most people are going to do that within the EHR. And so, you know, if we can get away from regulating the, the functions and features of the EHR and move to more of a, if you will, a value-based care, <laughs> a, 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 you know, a results-driven uh, approach about what are the results we want from people who use an EHR. I think that would be a huge mindset shift and it would create a, a, the proper incentives for people to use technology and it won't hijack the development lifecycle of EHR vendors as much as it does now. Mm. I like that. I like that. That's a good IT one. <laughs> it's a hard change, though, because it is a change in mindset, right? It's much it easier to certify features and functions versus actual results. But I, I think it creates weird incentives when you do. Well, in a, in a sense, what I'm hearing, you know, what I kind of internalize that as you're almost proposing a value based care version of, 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 a, of a policy instead of focusing on the input side. And then, then the nitty gritty, you, got, you should focus on the outcomes and we should incent those outcomes somehow through the legislation rather than specify, oh, you have to use X, Y, Z, or this is the way it has to be done. Because we know, as we've seen, people will cut corners to meet those. And then also those, whatever uh, levels you set today may not be applicable a year or two or three years from now, where it becomes like, that's so basic, it doesn't help me in the current models. So I agree. I think we should incentivize the outcome. And the results. Yeah. 
And for those that have PTSD, I'll just use this phrase uh, effectively for them. You know, if they become meaningful users if they produce the right outcome. <laughs> <laughs> ah, yes. Back in, you're mentioning the heyday. <laughs> <laughs> we all love well, meaningful my users. <laughs> my regulatory change, the one that's on my wish list, is one that's very near and dear to my heart and, and one that I've been writing about on, on Sway Health. And that is to finally get a decision made and basically relax, relaxing of a guidance that came out around HIPAA violation and the tracking pixels on websites. Um, you know, I think we can't have the Wild West that we had before. I get that. But how they've clamped down now is way too much where, you know, if you simply visit a website... And then that website says, oh, you know, you saw a smoking, you were looking at some smoking cessation program, and then they want to do a retargeting ad on the next time you're on, you know, Facebook, but they don't know who you are still. I, I can't see that as a HIPAA violation, right? And that hurts healthcare so much who are struggling right now to bring people into these programs and bring people into the service lines they are. They need every, uh, every advertising mechanism they can legally use. And basically what this legislation has done is cut all that off. You cannot use Google Analytics. You cannot use Facebook Meta's Pixel. And so now all these healthcare organizations are having to scramble, redo their websites for no reason other than to just comply with this law, right? And, and it doesn't, at the end of it, it actually doesn't really help patients or protect them any more or less than before, right? Like it, there's not really a lot of benefit to this one. So I really hope that in 2024, we can get to a better middle ground than where we are now, because right now the pendulum is swinging one way to the other. And it's just causing a lot of extra extraneous spending that I believe is just a waste of money. That's a good point. Like where was the damage to all these patients because the pixel was used? But I think we could tell you lots of stories of patients who discovered a treatment or a care at a certain center that they wouldn't have got otherwise because of the advertising that was given to them. So, you know, like I haven't heard a lot of stories about where it's damaged. I've heard of hypothetical, potentially something has happened, but I haven't heard of any patients that have actually been hurt by those that used it. And everyone is using it, right? Like almost like, so, you know, it's like if everyone was using it and interpreted that way and didn't see the problem, and we don't hear a lot of stories of people being damaged by it, and yet we probably have, could create hundreds of stories, thousands of stories where they got better care because of it, uh, you know, that is a problem. Yeah, and, and, you know, let's be honest, there was some risk, right? You know, this information was going to to Google and to, to Facebook. Yeah. But, and, and I can understand maybe saying you shouldn't use these things on your patient portal because you already know who they are. Why are you using a patient portal? Why are you tracking them? So I can understand that. But like websites, right? And you're, to your point, John, like using location-based services to recommend the closest physician. Well, you have to disable that now. And so how horrible is that? Like to, to not have that beautiful piece of functionality available to you when you visit a healthcare website for the first time. So I'm, I know we're going to eventually end up in a better middle ground. I just wish we'd get there faster. Because right now, the whole organ, you know, a lot of organizations are just really scrambling to redo, revamp their websites at a time when that money, I think, could be better spent on other things. So that's on the top of my wish list for 2023, 2024. You might get so that. Fi <laughs> so final, final question for you, John. What conference would you like to see that doesn't exist today? All right. So this is one that you're not going to enjoy, but I would enjoy a lot. And that's, okay. I would love the health IT cruise, you know, like I would love to go on a cruise with a bunch of health IT nerds and just nerd out the whole time, have some fun. Of course, cruises are a lot of fun, uh, you know, but, you know, I think when you go on a cruise, you're stuck in one place and you, you, you connect on a different level. And I that's my favorite part of conferences, right, is connecting on a different level with people. And so doing a health IT cruise, uh, it could be healthcare marketing. I'm down with all my healthcare marketing peeps. But like, you know, a cruise, uh, you know, with all those people having a good time, being able to share, have deep conversations late into the night, you know, in between the comedy show and the dancing, right? Like, so that that would be my my dream conference uh, that doesn't exist today. I mean, I, doctors go on them. Doctors go on these cruises and get CEUs all the time. Uh, you know, they, they get paid to go on these in order to get their CEUs or they use their CEU money to do it. But I think health IT needs that. Interesting. Yes, I could never go on that. <laughs> to that event i would You're never not a fan of the boats like me <laughs> i'm not a fan of the boats or that movement no uh, although you know it'd probably be the safest boat 
in terms of healthcare, right? Like, <laughs> you know, I'm sure there'd be yeah. lots of people telling me, here's what I need to do to feel better. But uh, no, that's not for me. But I, I understand that. it would be kind of cool to get everyone together talking, you know, basically uh, not connected, <laughs> right? Um, and you could and do it just... in an all inclusive resort in Cancun or something. That would work for you. How's that? There you go. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Um, no, for me, I mean, this is an interesting question, you know, lots of different ideas, but what I would love, and this has no business value, <laughs> and it's just more uh, uh, intellectual. I would love to see a conference that brings together the fringe parts of healthcare in the sense of music and healthcare, art and healthcare, you know, theater and healthcare, you know, therapy, you know, therapy dogs and healthcare, sort of these, these sort of outside, I'll call it fringe areas of healthcare, where we know there's benefit. We know there's benefit to music and healthcare. We've seen the benefit of art and healthcare, but actually to bring that all together into one conference where you can see all of this, I think would be intellectually very stimulating just to hear an artist talk about art therapy and, mm. and a music, a musician talking about mu how music actually has an emotional impact on the human brain and, I know there are conferences like this, but they're all sort of individual. I think bringing that all together and kind of blending it with some of the more traditional healthcare, I think it would be very fascinating. I would love to see that kind of conference. Yeah, it's almost like a South by Southwest for the health arts. Like, it's kind of, yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I, I, you know, I just think it's cool. There's a lot of undiscovered stuff there. And I think that would be, to your point, I think actually after leaving the conference like that, you would have all these ideas, right, of, and inspiration. And I think that's what sometimes is lacking from the conferences we go to. They're either very, very clinical, they're very IT focused, which are great, uh, don't get me wrong, but there isn't that freedom to explore, right? Mm -hmm. We don't have that creativity moments uh, when at the conferences we go to. So I'd love to see that somehow in a conference. That'd be fun. <laughs> that would be fun. Okay, well, that brings us to an end of another episode. So thanks to all of you who tuned into this episode of Healthcare IT Today. You can find more details about our show by checking out the programs page on healthcarenowradio.com. And please share your voice and engage with the community at healthcareittoday.com and on social media using the hashtag HITSM. I'm Colin Hung, along with my friend and health IT collaborator, John Lin. Thanks for listening and have a great week.